So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the f final morning. It kind of feels as if we're um, coming round the last bend into the home straight. And as people know, the home straight is often when the most exciting things happen. So on the basis of that slightly flimsy analogy, we can uh, look forward to some exciting talks this morning. And the first one is from Steve Cranwell, who works for BirdLife in the Pacific. And he will be talking about developing partnerships in that region of the world. Steve. Thank you, Mark. OK, well, thanks, folks. Here goes. Um, yeah, this, this comes with, with several confessions, um, uh, and uh, I think of which um, I probably don't need to reveal now. But uh, if all goes well, um, there's certainly no need to reveal them. And, um, if it doesn't, the shortcomings will be obvious to everyone. So um, anyway, what I'm here to talk about is, is uh, um, um, the work of the, the BirdLife Pacific Partnership and those supporting it in addressing um, invasive species response to island restoration uh, in the region. Given I've been in the region for well, over, well, for at least 10 years, you'd think that wouldn't be so difficult. But anyway, believe you me, I had no idea this was going to be so um, so who are we? Well, um, BirdLife is, is a, uh, uh, a global network of 120 uh, partners in as many countries. Um, and we have a common purpose uh, within that network of uh, aiming to uh, strive to conserve birds, their habitats, and, um, and by extension, uh, global biodiversity. Uh, working through a membership of over 10 million people um, and uh, toward a, a sustainable, uh, toward the sustainable use of, of natural resources. Um, within the Pacific, there are uh, a relatively small proportion of those partners. There are seven, <coughs> uh, five of those within the tropical Pacific, including uh, two in the French territories uh, and Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the five tropical partners are, are typically uh, small um, in population and also GDP. And uh, if you like, that's relatively characteristic of, of uh, the, the symptoms, if you like, that, that uh, underlie their, their financial and, and broader kind of capacity constraints. And as such, you know, they have a, a staff of um, maybe two or three. Uh, a maximum of 12 and a, um, uh, an income, if you like, that's, that's uh, uh, somewhat commensurate with that. New Zealand or Australia, conversely, there are around 40 staff and, uh, yeah, they have uh, significantly greater annual funding. Uh, the conservation programs that, that these partners typically support include a range of um, biodiversity protection, um, species management, including invasive, uh, invasive alien species, um, land, land protection, and, uh, and marine. And they also play a large sort of advocacy role um, in terms of yeah, promoting uh, these, these uh, marine land protection interests and so on at a, at a national interest. Uh, one thing that certainly they all have in common is that they are obviously separated by vast distances and uh, similarly uh, travel, if you like, um, between those is is invariably infrequent and uh, always expensive. Um, so the Pacific Island region, uh, in a nutshell, it's, it's, as I'm sure you're aware, it's huge. It's um, mostly water. And uh, in fact, the third of the Earth's planet is, is the, uh, the Pacific Ocean, of which all but 2% is land. Um, <coughs> um, of all but 2%? Anyway. Uh, 2% 2, 2 is land, uh, of which, yeah, those, those islands are tw about 25,000 scattered across it. And um, um, it was colonised, if you like, from the, uh, from the western side, so the sort of Philippines, uh, Indonesia and, and Papua New Guinea about 35,000 years ago, moving uh, eastward into um, uh, Melanesia, so Fiji, Vanuatu, French... Uh, Fiji, Vanuatu, and, and uh, the Solomons, uh, and similarly into uh, Micronesia, Palau, uh, the Marianas, before then undertaking uh, incredible voyaging feats into uh, remote Oceania, if you like, so um, 
uh, French Polynesia and ultimately uh, New Zealand uh, arriving around about a thousand, uh, a thousand years ago. There was a second wave of colonization that uh, essentially kicked off in about the 1700s as Europeans uh, ventured southward, uh, mostly uh, uh, whalers and sealers. Inevitably, as people moved through the region, they brought with them uh, their crops and, and uh, livestock, uh, pigs, dogs, rats. Uh, they were uh, commensal, if you like, with the uh, early voyages. And um, they also obviously brought with them their traditions and, and uh, uh, way of life, uh, and, uh, which was very much um, based around the resources available. Um, similarly, when Europeans came, uh, they weren't so different other than they brought uh, a whole host of other um, um, species and, uh, uh, yeah, many of those, as we know, were particularly problematic, uh, pathogens, plants and animals. Uh, biologically, uh, the islands are, are obviously hugely hugely isolated and uh, as, as by virtue of that, if you like, the flora and fauna is represented by um, very high levels of, of endemism and, um, and relatively low diversity, perhaps PNG, or not perhaps, PNG being the exception. Um, these uh, characteristics, characteristics, if you like, which uh, when, when combined with um, uh, introductions and, and uh, habitat loss make them particularly uh, particularly vulnerable to extinction. Um, just a little bit of a, a sort of context in terms of birds in the Pacific. So uh, they are a, a, a significant component and an emblematic component, if you like, of the fauna, and they're, they're used in, in many ways. And so they, they form part of the, uh, the culture. Um, they're very much part of a sort of traditional uh, ceremony. Um, headdress, um, yeah, attire. They also were an important um, means of navigation, a very good way of, of being able to find land by early voyages, and um, uh, <coughs> to some extent, well, certainly uh, historically, perhaps less so now, they also provided a, um, a valuable food resource, particularly perhaps seabirds, but also uh, other yeah, ground nesting um, land birds uh, in terms of eggs and so on. And they, yeah, are fantastic fish finders. So uh, a, a precursor, if you like, to uh, modern day GPS. And uh, they remain, yeah, as relevant uh, for many of these societies today in terms of uh, locating fish as, as they did several hundred years ago. Uh, the story of biodiversity on loss on, on islands will be no, no surprise, I don't think, to, to anyone here. Um, but just to perhaps quickly touch on it, um, the uh, loss of habitats through fire, agricultural conversion, um, and along with the introduction of invasive species, have wrought havoc on these islands um, and uh, combined, if you like, with a relatively naive and, and poorly equipped um, fauna, uh, has made them particularly vulnerable to, uh, to mammalian predators and browsers. Um, as a consequence, what remains, uh, the fauna that remains here today is, is really a remnant of uh, certainly what was there historically. And among birds alone, we know that, well, uh, uh, the information suggests that, that we've probably lost half of, of what was there. And uh, prior to 1500, um, between somewhere between 900 and 1900 species of bird alone uh, are thought to have gone extinct with a further 50 since, so um, uh, since 15, uh, 1500. And sadly, this extinction trend very much continues uh, with nearly a quarter of, of uh, the region's 1,300-odd birds um, now globally threatened. So with many, with many uh, sites, if you like, in which uh, we could be uh, focusing our conservation attention, there's been various efforts made to try and um, um, identify that, if you like. And um, among the first of the, and, and they often have uh, similar, if you like, um, and, and overlapping 
um, focuses, but maybe coming from the perspective of, of different taxa or, or different um, um, habitat variables. The approach that BirdLife has taken is an uh, international one, and um, that, that has focused around the globally important bird areas. And uh, that was rolled out in the region, implemented by BirdLife partners, and uh, essentially looked to identify areas that were most uh, of greatest importance for the conservation of birds. Um, that process didn't necessarily add new information around invasive species and, and other pressures, if you like, but uh, it did pull existing resources and, um, and essentially give uh, some indication of the probable uh, uh, status of those habitats uh, in, in terms of the, those IBAs. Um, where was I going with that? Uh, so yeah, so essentially these these were that's right. So these IBAs provide the uh, the basis for the conservation priorities, um, and uh, and very much so in terms of where we look to focus our island restoration effort, um, and uh, this being the 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 foundation for the work that the BirdLife Partnership has has uh, focused its uh, conservation efforts around. Um, there are other, there are other complementary um, prioritisation processes that have all also fed into this. So the um, the uh, IBAs are, are not static. We continue to update and inform them uh, with new in, uh, survey information, which also flows through to um, identify uh, island restoration priorities, and um, um, other complementary processes such as the uh, global islands uh, inventory or um, which looks specifically at globally threatened birds and, and reptiles as uh, international priorities for restoration uh, uh, complement this or, or we complement that and there are similar uh, processes for instance that uh, the RSPB have undertaken for the UK overseas territories which also so the, the, all those mechanisms work together in terms of setting these island restoration priorities. Uh, what we then, we'd, we'd, so what we then did, have, having uh, identified areas of, of interest, if you like, is um, set up demonstration projects in, um, in five Pacific Island countries to start with: Fiji, Palau, uh, French Polynesia, the Cook Islands, and New Caledonia. Um, really, with the purpose of of establishing the capability around um, island restoration in terms of managing invasive species and um, establishing capability for um, bird life partners and, and countries to, um, uh, to, to do further work in terms of island restoration. Uh, the program is, is coordinated by bird life in, uh, in Fiji. Uh, these demonstration sites were typically less than 20 hectares in area. Um, um, we sought to, obviously they had being IBAs, uh, some significant biodiversity value that was primarily that, um, in relation to seabirds. Uh, we, tip, uh, we purposely focused them around having one species of vertebrate, um, and in all, all of these instances it was Pacific rat. Uh, no, non, uh, no sensitive non-target species, and uh, you know, we didn't want to sort of uh, complicate it further with uh, issues to do with um, yeah, potential um, um, loss of globally threatened species or yeah, managing those in, in uh, combination. All the operations were either hand broadcast or um, um, with bait stations and purposely obviously the islands were un uninhabited. So, um, In terms of the actual process that it went through, so uh, obviously the consultation is a, a major component. Um, the majority of Pacific Island land is, is owned by the traditional owners and uh, they are, even though many of these sites may be <coughs> very remote from where they are and, uh, and uh, infrequently visited, they're still very connected to, uh, to their uh, traditional lands. So having a, 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 a bottom-up, if you like, or, or um, direct conversation with people about what what these interests are about and, and building their support is fundamental to not just you know actually doing the operation but trying to sustain the outcomes. 
So that, this work was led by the uh, national partner who, you know, they are inherently well equipped, if you like, to do that. They are obviously of the country, they understand the traditions and protocols, they are able to carry a message that uh, resonates with, with the local community and they're, well, they're extremely well connected, um, whether that's at a, a senior government or official level or in working with um, other suppliers and, and service providers, if you like, in supporting these, work, uh, supporting these operations. Um, Perhaps just as, as a way of illustrating that, um, not so much as part of one of the demonstration projects, we had a, uh, an operation in, in Fiji which was looking to remove goats. Um, and this is kind of getting into the, the area where, uh, you know, the, the, the more socially valued a species is, the, the more difficult it is, if you like, to, to perhaps get the, uh, the support for its removal. And this uh, interest had been kicking around the conservation community for probably 20 odd years. And it wasn't until there was somebody uh, that was from that community that was actually interested in, in carrying that, that message forward, if you like, that the conversation was able to, uh, to progress. And, and certainly uh, there were uh, adaptations needed to the methodology to, and, and also other uh, incentives, if you like, to overcome the, the loss of, of uh, use, really, that local people um, had from, from those goats. Ultimately, it, it, it meant that, that that operation was able to be completed and fully supported, and, and that island, Monoriki, remains uh, goat-free today. So it's, it's a hugely powerful part of the... Um, uh, the the restoration process. Uh, in terms of the planning component, as I've, as I've mentioned, uh, there was relatively uh, little expertise or experience among partners in, in undertaking this. And so we obviously needed to embed the, uh, the knowledge and skills uh, within the, this group as, as well as we could. And that was um, undertaken through a, a, a multifaceted approach of, of working with uh, other technical partners, notably um, uh, Pacific Invasives Initiative, um, New Zealand Department of Conservation, and, and latterly um, Island Conservation, and building up those, that skill base. And uh, we did it in a number of ways, one of which was, uh, as I say, at the, at the um, inception to uh, host a a specific sort of formal training workshop around essentially establishing the, uh, the, the principles and processes around eradication, what this is all about, you know, um, and, uh, and then, you yeah, complementing that with sort of uh, field-based exchanges and, and work with um, experts and, and building that appreciation, if you like, of, of um, information collection, looking at, at uh, assessing, for instance, crab densities, um, uh, identification of species and so on. Um, that continued throughout and was complemented through all, all, all manner of other means, peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange, uh, uh, obviously experts assisting um, uh, local partners in the, in the planning process as well. Um, in terms of the implementation, uh, again this was, was locally led uh, by the partner and supported by um, whether it was Palauans or Fijians or, or um, Tahitians uh, in, in the country of interest. Uh, similarly, having experts, if you like, part of that, that implementation was also equally important. Um, it enabled uh, people to uh, provide advice and the inevitable sort of changes and problems that arise um, and essentially gave the partner the confidence to be able to um, implement the operation uh, among their, their peers or their, their people. Um, partnerships, okay, damn. Uh, so this is kind of the essence of what the slide is all about and I was thinking, well maybe, I mean the talk is all about, but in some ways it's probably a, a little bit redundant given that we've talked so much about it already, but I was really just trying to sort of think, well, okay, what are the, what are the, the kind of key parts to the to, to some of these sort of partnership relationships. And um, 
uh, perhaps they can be broken down into, uh, into two groups, one of which is a regional one and, and, and the local one. So the regional entity essentially was the, the external uh, part to the uh, implementing partner and they provided the technical expertise, uh, such as I was saying through PI, DOC or Island Conservation and others, um, and also uh, the funders. So BirdLife would uh, often uh, derive the majority of the funding for the implementation of these, um, of these, these projects and needed to obviously work with the partner and, and, uh, and, and building the understanding of, of what it was that, that we were looking to accomplish because ultimately BirdLife was, was accountable for um, the, the, um, uh, the purpose, if you like. Locally, the um, uh, communities, uh, government and uh, other service providers, they were all best obviously supported by uh, the national partner, as I say, then uh, they have the, the relationship and, um, and also the knowledge of, of um, people that work in those communities. Um, okay, so um, post, post, uh, post uh, pilot, if you like, there have been a further 25 operations that have been completed. Uh, three of these are, uh, have been aerial ones. Um, there are uh, five of them, um, sorry, five inf uh, invasive, further invasive species have been removed. Um, three inhabited or partially inhabited islands and, um, and they've also increased in island size. So essentially, you know, there's been, it's gone from a relatively uh, simple uh, model to a much uh, larger and sort of complex one. Um, the results from these, well initially they were, they were relatively limited, uh, sorry, relatively mixed and we had um, sort of of the five initial operations, uh, two of them were unsuccessful, one was, was partially successful and, and obviously two others were. Um, what followed on from that was with the other 25, uh, there was a significant increase in the success rate and uh, I put that as, you know, essentially there's a minimum of 88%. Some of the complexity in terms of uh, some of these sites is in, in managing atolls, you essentially have multiple sites within a site, if you like. So you could be partially successful on, on uh, uh, say, some of those islets, or you could be fully successful, I should say, with, with uh, some of those islets, but fail perhaps on one of the um, 20 that are there. And so that's what I mean, it's a, a minimum of 88%. 88, 88 um, and yeah, for, for all other taxa, it's, it's, uh, that was completely successful. And in terms of biosecurity, uh, only one has, has been uh, partially reinvaded, but actually that's, that's not a biosecurity issue, having said that. Uh, that was to do with the proximity of, of other motu uh, on that atoll that meant essentially rats were able to reinvade. Okay, so. So what, what difference have these uh, operations made? Well, they've, they've increased uh, bird diversity. Uh, we are starting to see um, uh, species returning uh, that, that uh, haven't been recorded for these sites previously. Uh, there's been a, a notable increase in uh, reptiles, or particularly the Fiji crested iguana. You may have heard from an earlier talk that I think has been given in this um, conference about, about that. Um, there's been extensive vegetation recovery, particularly where goats uh, obviously are present and, um, and among marine birds, um, things like uh, fairy, uh, the fairy tern, uh, there was a notable increase in breeding success there, the recruitment of uh, Polynesian storm petrel. So some globally threatened species uh, certainly have been able to respond. There are a number of challenges and one of, one of them is really to do with uh, the degree with which we've been able to uh, monitor the, the impact, if you like, of that change, so either the, in, the intensity or the consistency uh, and, and, and the frequency of the data collection. And uh, absolutely biosecurity remains a major challenge, if you like, in uh, sus sustaining the protection of these sites long term. Um, capacity development. <coughs> so while I say that um, biosecurity is, has, is a challenge, it's also been a, a major success, and, and particularly at a, at a local level. Um, so uh, 
communities have have uh, picked up on the uh, implementation of that, uh, particularly at some sites in Palau and French Polynesia. Uh, dogs have been trained and are being used uh, in, uh, in some of these uh, high priority sites. And um, the yeah, so the, and the other the other some other uh, capacity components that have come out are include the uh, increase in uh, networks, if you like, and, and partnerships that have been developed around um, the partners, and so they're able to essentially uh, work with uh, other tech, technical experts and, and so on independently. And uh, um, yeah, there certainly are challenges in terms of the size of of um, the organisation and the um, uh, the financial security, if you, if you like, that they have, and that essentially they're very dependent on project funding. Uh, socioeconomic um, outcomes, so we've got uh, protected uh, yes, uh, protected areas have been established, um, and there's potentially some uh, livelihood outcomes uh, around copra uh, in, in, in particular. Uh, there are a number of challenges associated with that in terms of the relationship between um, both biodiversity and socioeconomics uh, on, a, on, a, on a single site. Uh, 2017 to 2021, essentially we're just looking to uh, build on uh, this foundation. So there are a number of uh, operations that are being developed in all of the countries, uh, notably French Polynesia, where there are a large number of globally threatened species and need an opportunity, if you like, for addressing uh, the threats at those sites. Really strengthening the intra-island biosecurity, which is a major weakness and uh, monitoring outcomes at, at predator-free sites. Um, so just to try and quickly wrap up on some of the, some of the summary and conclusions, um, I think you know, what has been uh, achieved is, is uh, significant, at least signaling what's, what's possible for Pacific Islands and largely by Pacific Islanders. Um, operationally, it's been mostly a case of taking the tools that have been developed and, and adapting and applying them to a local situation not that this in any way diminishes the um, significance of the effort or the accomplishment. However, the, the challenges, if you like, of uh, moving forward with increased pace and scale and addressing the 300 or so bird species alone, um, not to manage, mention you know, reptiles, mollusks and so other, other things, um, in, in terms of stopping them from going over the edges, is, is substantial. Um, but you know, some of the, I think some of the aspects that, that we can be particularly positive about are, uh, 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 nationally based civil society organisations are particularly effective um, uh, in, in getting uh, this work happening and catalysing an interest in, and uh, essentially uh, demonstration projects are a successful way of doing that. Governments are beginning to increase their uh, involvement. Uh, most have in, um, uh, invasive species management plans and uh, there is essentially a, a greater focus from them in, in looking to be engaged and involved. Um, and success has been achieved obviously in a number of countries now and uh, we, I think perhaps most important we've also learnt a number of lessons um, which have enabled us to, to, to build uh, from where we were seven or ten years ago. And I think that's probably enough. <laughs> because I can see a red light. <laughs> Great, thanks very much, Steve. I, um, I think in the interests of keep, time. more or less keeping to time, we should press on um, to the next talk, and that's going to be by um, Nancy Bunbury. I think most of us uh, uh, reckon that bird eradications are lagging behind mammal eradications, and Nancy is going to be talking about some successes with bird eradications in the Seychelles. That's the old one. That's the old one. <laughs> no, there should be. We just checked this morning and there was a version two. That had been uploaded. I had it on a stick. Yeah, you've got oh, yeah. There it is, here it is, yeah. No problem. Okay, good morning, everybody. 
Um, I'm Nancy Bunbury. I work for the Seychelles Islands Foundation, or SIF, um, which has conducted several invasive bird eradications in the last five years from the Seychelles. Um, invasive bird management is, as everybody knows, uh, quite a long way behind invasive mammal management in terms of, well, everything really, um, development of best practices, any practices or standards, um, research um, and successes. Um, certainly when we started planning these eradications, we faced considerable skepticism um, from many directions, um, but at least four or five of these eradications have been successful, so I would like to share some of the details um, and um, the lessons learned. Uh, everybody knows where the Seychelles is by now. Uh, SIF manages the two UNESCO World Heritage Sites of the country, and these are Aldabra Atoll, which is a raised coral atoll in the southwest of the archipelago, um, and the Valley de May, which is a palm forest on the island of Pralin in the Inner Islands. At both sites, we have endemic species which are threatened by invasives. Um, in, for both sites, in fact, we had a situation where invasive birds on a nearby island were threatening endemics um, at the sites. In the case of Aldabra, which, has, which had an entirely native um, avifauna at the time, <coughs> including an endemic species of Fodi and a native subspecies of Bulbul. The island of Assumption was only, is only 27 kilometres away and had populations of introduced red whisker Bulbuls and Madagascar Fodies. At the time, Aldabra um, was considered free of introduced birds. In fact, it was supposedly the largest tropical island which was free of introduced birds. But in 2012, after we started, we found both species in a remote part of the atoll. Um, Pralin has an endemic species of parrot, the Seychelles black parrot, which is endemic to the island of Pralin. Uh, Mahe, the main island of the Seychelles, is only 37 kilometers away and had a growing population of introduced ringneck parakeets. And they were considered the main threat at the time to this very small population of black parrots. So, um, SIF decided to do something about it and to take on eradications of, of all of the species um, on these islands. Uh, we managed to get funding to tackle all three islands um, at roughly the same time under EU funding. All of them started with a sort of soft phase, which included surveys um, to look at abundance and distribution of the birds and also trials of methods um, to determine the most effective eradication techniques. Um, and then we did around three years on each project of intensive eradication. And um, that's when we focused the efforts really on just getting the bird numbers down as quickly as we could. Um, and that stopped when there were no detectable birds left. And then they all ended up with a monitoring phase uh, when we tried to confirm absence of birds. The methods we used uh, differed per species and island, um, but on Aldabra, mainly uh, mist netting, quite strongly supplemented by shooting with the air rifle. Um, on Assumption, mist netting dominated the first two years because the birds were at very high densities, um, so it was by far the most um, yeah, dominant method there. Shooting then was, we shifted to in the final year when the densities dropped. Um, on Mahi, shooting was the main method with the ringnecks um, because we had very limited success with mist netting and we were not able to catch birds in traps, but I'll come back to this in a second. The problems we faced uh, differed quite widely uh, depending on the site, the island and the species. On Aldabra, our main problem was the very close resemblance of the target species, the Madagascar Fodi, with the endemic Aldabra Fodi. Apparently, they agreed um, because they quickly hybridized. And <laughs> so this picture shows the Aldabra Fodi on the right and the Madagascar Fodi on the left. The Aldabra Fodi is, is bigger um, and has uh, less red on its body and a, a larger beak. You can't really see it there. Uh, this is what the hybrid looks like. Um, as typical, I think, on uh, most of the islands I've been hearing about, uh, we also faced problems with the density of the vegetation, um, very harsh terrain. This is, this is a typical Aldabra uh, landscape scene. 
very jagged uh, limestone, um, which is a bit of a nightmare to cross at all, let alone quickly, <laughs> and very demanding logistics because of Aldabra's location. On assumption, we had many more birds than were initially estimated, and um, that was compounded by the fact that they were behaving quite differently to what we'd experienced elsewhere. And they were basically not trappable um, on assumption, and several of us had had experience trapping fodies elsewhere. So that was, um, that was a surprise, and that delayed the project slightly at the beginning. They were also very, very wary of humans, uh, more so than we'd seen in other places, even, even before we started the eradication. On Mahe, uh, the ringnecks fly, we've found to fly higher um, than, than we expected. So mist netting, although we, we did try to use high mist nets, so we set up aerial rigs um, in the canopy, <coughs> as you can see in the top two pictures, uh, to try and catch some of these birds. We had some success, but it was, it was just a very inefficient method. Um, the bottom left picture here is, shows a big group of birds coming into roost, so that's, how, that's typically how high they will fly when they come into roost. Um, and we tried numerous sorts of traps that have worked very well elsewhere. Um, we tweaked the designs, we tested different baits, we did all sorts, um, but we didn't manage to catch a single bird. We also used decoys in them and playback, um, but it wasn't successful. So that left shooting as the only viable alternative. But... Um, Mahe is an inhabited island of 80,000 people and most of the eradication activities had to take place in the inhabited areas. Um, the Seychelles is extremely sensitive about the use of firearms for historical reasons, so this actually delayed the project for about two years at the beginning. Eventually we did get permission to shoot under certain conditions um, and the project was able to go ahead. Parakeets, of course, are very intelligent species. Um, they learn to recognize the project car, um, the project <laughs> staff uniforms, and uh, firearms very quickly. Uh, so we, we had to be very, very cautious about how we approached the shooting. And of course, because it was an inhabited island, uh, we had to consider uh, public feeling about the project, um, also because we really depended um, on the public reporting uh, to get as, many, as much information as we could about these birds. Um, luckily, most of the Seychelles um, felt were in favour of the project um, because they're quite aware of the effects on agriculture and um, also on endemic species. So we were quite lucky with that. Just some very brief and basic results. Um, in terms of numbers, we have culled 3,000, almost 300 Madagascar fodies on assumption and nearly 5,300 red-whiskered baubles. On Aldabra, there was only one red whisker bubble. Um, we actually thought there were a few more, um, but it turned out that this, this one bird had a very large territory. <laughs> uh, it's shown here with his captor. Um, we also got 260 Madagascar fodies. So these, the eradications on both of these islands have been successful. On Mahe, there were 544 ringnecks culled so far. There may be one left. Um, we have a team tr out trekking, trying to, trying to confirm that as I speak, um, but we are hoping to be able to confirm success within the next year. Um, in terms of relative success with the methods, um, shooting was the dominant method for the um, parakeets. Uh, mist netting was caught many more birds on assumption for both species. Um, that's because the shooting came in at the end when the numbers were much lower. Um, and on Aldabra, it was in between. So, lessons learned. The main lesson I think we've taken from this is that it can be done. Um, Large-scale bird eradications on islands are feasible. And I think the time is probably ripe to start developing the methods for this. Um, secondly, the threats that we had based the eradication on um, don't seem to have been alarmist, uh, which, which had been mentioned at the time. Uh, several of them were verified during the eradication, so all three of the bird species reached the islands of concern. Um, one of them, the Madagascar Fodi, formed a breeding population on Aldabra very quickly. Um, 
we managed to confirm hybridization, and we also detected several novel pathogens um, which didn't occur in the endemics. Thirdly, um, don't rely on what you know of the species elsewhere um, without doing new trials. It seems that the same species can behave very differently in different places. Um, similarly, um, one size doesn't fit all. So um, even within the same species on the same island, we had to constantly tweak and update our approaches and techniques um, just to maintain um, capture, capture efficiency. I couldn't resist this one. <laughs> Don't count your eggs before they hatch. We had more birds, um, except for the bubble on Aldabra, more birds than we est initially estimated in all cases, up, up to double the numbers. Um, and that was using methods like distance sampling, and for the parakeets, we used roost counts. Um, by identifying your target species weak spots uh, seems to help a lot. Um, for the, in the case of the ringneck, it was very much their, their habit of communally roosting. Um, they use roost sites, reliable roost sites, over the long term unless they're disturbed. Um, and this means that you can track the birds, you can count the birds, and ultimately you can target the birds. Um, the boobles have a very nice habit of um, vocalizing loudly and prominently on high bits of vegetation that stand out above the rest of it. So, um, yeah, we were able to, um, especially in the final stage of the project, um, target the rest of the birds like that. Um, and the Madagascar fodies, we realized, um, tend to form groups, large groups of birds in the non-breeding season um, that fly quite low between the vegetation, so we could misnet large groups of them like that. And the males are very conspicuous in breeding plumage, and that can lead to um, females and juveniles as well. Um, we found research a really uh, valuable part of our management decisions on the ground. Uh, so um, we used, we set up a collaboration quite quickly with the Madagascar Fodies on Aldabra, and with that we managed to confirm not just the invasion origin and timing, um, but also the fact that the birds were hybridizing. And then a critical part of the project was in training local staff. So at the, at the beginning of the project, there were almost no skills in the country to be able to deal with, with these eradications. So we brought in international experts, and they <coughs> trained more than 30 staff um, on the ground very intensively, and five of those staff then went on to lead parts of the eradications. That was seen as a major success of the project in country. Um, it improved um, national um, capacity in invasive species management, and it gave a very good, a strong sense of ownership um, to the project, which helped then with um, continuity and follow-up. If um, you need to use publicity, uh, we um, belatedly realized it would be a good idea to assess the effectiveness of each type of publicity. So initially for the parakeets, we went all out. We, we used every possible method we could think of to reach everybody on the island. Um, and then we decided to start asking people where they'd heard about the project. And it turns out that about 80% of them had heard through TV. So um, we focused our visibility funding on, on the TV part of it. And, uh, sorry, <laughs> lastly, uh, in this case, um, we mainly um, completed preemptive eradications uh, rather than reactive ones, and they do seem to have been very effective for protection of these endemic species. So in, in conclusion, um, as far as I know, none of these species have been eradicated in such large numbers from any other islands. Um, so I think it substantially um, advances the field um, and hopefully it can be used for um, other practitioners wanting to, wanting to conduct similar eradications elsewhere. So thanks to funders, staff, collaborators and everyone for listening. Right, thank you, Nancy, for that really very encouraging count of a bird eradication success. Um, once again, we're running a teeny bit late, so I don't think we can go with questions, but instead move on to David Movelli's account, which will take us back to the Pacific that um, Steve Cranwell has talked about in his splendid uh, keynote address. And David, uh, again, is going to talk about regional programmes he's been involved with in the Pacific. Thanks, mate. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk more about uh, a little bit higher level um, using uh, a, a project we just finished last year to show you what uh, the Pacific's been up to and where we're at and where we're looking to go forward. Um, like everyone else, we have a lot of partners. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk a little, set the scene a little bit, a bit like Steve, I guess, um, and then talk about our, our strategy in the Pacific and how we try and overcome some of those challenges. Um, look at some of the success we've had in the project and how they relate in general to the overall success in the Pacific, and then look at what we can do about stepping it up in the future. Uh, so setting the scene. Um, as Steve said, uh, Pacific ecosystems are one of the world's uh, biodiversity hotspots and a lot of species are found nowhere else in the world. Uh, we hot face some of the highest extinction rates in the world. We have a lot of islands and as Steve said 90% of the land tenure is customary so it's very important to work with local people. Uh, Palangi in the Pacific, I put this slide in to put some context into it. Um, what we bring to the Pacific are uh, generally Palangi ideas, sorry for those who don't know what Palangi means, that's Samoan for uh, a white people or Western culture, um, when in fact uh, most of these uh, people still live a very subsistence lifestyle, so we're trying to put in Palangi ideas and they're being evaluated by Palangi uh, funders and they're viewed by Palangis in Palangi ways, so it's very important to understand the context. Um, the Pacific has a lot of invasive species and the largest driver of extinctions at the moment is invasive species. Uh, we commissioned a state of a conservation an Oceania report and the statistics for invasive species said that the status is poor, that it was deteriorating and that there was a medium confidence in the data that was suggesting that, which is higher than what a lot of the other focus areas had. So what do we do in the, in the Pacific to come and try and overcome some of these things? First of all, we have a series of co-op agencies and they are owned by all the Pacific countries and metropolitan countries. So we all work for 26 different countries. It's like being a civil servant for 26 countries, having 26 bosses. Um, but the beautiful thing about that is we get a chance to bring them together and to all agree on things which they can endorse. So we can move forward as a, as a region. Um, we have a comprehensive uh, framework for invasive species management, which we've had for uh, about eight years now. Um, and we use that extensively for all our planning. Um, it allows us to categorise to specific themes which everyone uh, are working on, and allows us to look um, nationally and regionally how well everyone's doing. It also allows us to, to look at gaps. We have two uh, Pacific Invasive Species Networks, the Pacific Invasive Partnership, which Phil Andriozzi, the chairman, talked about the other day. They're like our expert or uh, larger thinkers around the Pacific and consist of uh, organisations working in the Pacific on invasive species. And we have the Pacific Invasive Learning Network, which is um, a large group of practitioners, about 400, but we have a core pull uh, uh, team in most of the countries now. And we've just started to, knowledge, to manage our knowledge a bit better. So uh, now we have a, a resource base, which I'll show you in a minute, but we're developing uh, guides on common uh, issues that people have in the Pacific. So it's a first step to go to and work out where for them to go. And we're, it's all coming from case studies in the Pacific. So we're trying to take things we do in the Pacific, put them somewhere, and then feed it back into the Pacific. Um, this is where we store all our information, you should check it out. It's called the Battler Resource Base. It was just launched last year. There's about maybe about 260 um, documents on there at the moment. Um, we'll be putting a lot more on very soon. And you can also find a lot of things from the project here, including the guidelines. Um, some of the outcomes of the project. The project covered nine countries. There was over 100 activities. It was funded by the Global Environment Facility. Uh, implemented by UNEP and executed by us and our national part, uh, partners, agencies. And it was really a test run for the regional 
mechanisms, including the guidelines. It was, um, it was uh, written with the guidelines in mind and structured to the guidelines, and it um, required the use of all the, the other regional mechanisms to give them a bit of a test run. Um, the project scorecard was pretty good. Um, some of these countries had virtually no environmental invasive species, anything at the start of the project, and by the end, um, they were very successful in a lot of the, uh, the key areas of concern by the Global Environment Facility. Um, things that went really well was the strategic relevance of the project, um, achievement of the outputs, the sustainability, the political sustainability, um, the communication and awareness, and the supervision, guidance, and technical backstopping, which was crucial for the success of the project. Uh, the only place that got an unsatisfactory was um, pre preparation and readiness, and that's a very common thing in the Pacific, just because of the huge distances we have to organise logistics over, and things just take a lot longer. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to go through a few, a very few um, things in the project now, just to give you an idea. So, awareness of impacts. Um, some of the some of the things I thought were, were quite good is uh, on Nui we had a um, a pig uh, control strategy. Um, on Nui there's only about 1,600 people, but this Facebook um, post was seen by two million. Um, and this is our our coordinator on Nui. He had never caught a pig before this project, now he's uh, eradicated half the wild pigs on, on the way. And the way we did that was by bringing something that the island knew about, rugby. So we brought um, a legendary uh, All Black, Glenn Osborne up, who is also a legendary pig hunter and has a, a TV show, Hunting Aotearoa. And he came up and trained the locals, brought up proper dogs, all the correct gear, and it's just gone on. It's huge all around the island, the whole island loves it now. And they're all against killing pigs before that. Um, in Tonga, we, we, got, we uh, got the king and queen of Tonga involved. Um, the queen delivers uh, prizes to all the top students around Tonga at a special event, and uh, we provided scholarships for the students. So uh, the forest team that works in the forest after school, they were awarded prizes at the same time as all the people who scored the best in maths and all the rest of it, it's really good. And they're drawing a lot of attention to the forest now, it's a restoration project. Uh, Region-wide, we also try and target the young people. We had a, a um, school challenge last year, and it came with a video about the little fire ant using the rat as an identifier to, to introduce people to invasive species, and what people could do to stop the spread around the community. Uh, we developed quite a lot of national uh, invasive species strategy and action plans, all based on the guidelines, which is really where people need to start, countries need to start. We built a lot of capacity, um, particularly at a pool meeting, and also while we did a lot of the activities, we brought other countries in to, um, to learn uh, how to eradicate rats with Papua Island Conservation. Another example is we took a lot of the Polynesian countries to New Zealand for a restoration study tour to see what could be done and to get some uh, motivation from those successful people like the Department of Conservation, etc. Um, while, we, while we were uh, learning about um, eradicating rats, we managed to eradicate rats off uh, four islands and we also did one minor eradication in um, Kiribati. And, uh, the, the, the pace of, of eradication is, is increasing really fast now in the Pacific. Uh, we're definitely winning some war, wars on um, priority weeds. Um, there's good databases being used, um, good methods. And we're sustainably controlling some invasive animals as well. Um, we have a, a, an ongoing um, rat control program protecting the Tongan whistler on the Vavau and the Vavau uh, mountain of Mount Talau. Uh, the, the pig program in Nui is now sustainable and we have this rare endemic um, plant on Mount Talau which is being fenced out from, from pigs. There's only about 18 stems of that left in the world. And we are addressing some widespread weeds. Um, African tulip and mycania was a focus of the, the project just finished but there's a lot of opportunities for biocontrol for the Pacific, um, both within the Pacific 
and existing outside of the Pacific that are ready to go. And we're restoring some priority sites, um, which is restoration, looking after the site, animal control, weed control, revegetation. Um, stepping up the good fight. The first step, I always see it as trying to get a functioning uh, national institutionalised invasive species program going in the country and trying to provide a formal, effective and efficient regional support service to match the services to the needs. Um, this project has made significant progress. However, we have a new project that will be just uh, developing the project document now, which is uh, twice the size of the last one as far as finances go. And we've got a substantial uh, regional support system built into that project, which is fantastic the, um, for a funder to recognise the necessity of support for these, for these countries. But you know, and we also have an EGF 11 project starting up for the, t for the territories. However, these are setting in uh, stone national institutionalised um, invasive species programs, but there's still uh, tens of millions are required to address even the current threats of biodiversity. So what do we want to do about that? We've just uh, start embarking on a new strategic plan starting next year, and as you'll see, climate change resilience is an underlying theme for all of the work we do at SPREP, along with oceans. Um, invasive species is a massive impact on, uh, on resilience and ecosystem services, and we need to get into that market, if you like. Um, invasive species causes massive impacts around the Pacific um, from increased storm intensity and regularity. This is in Samoa in 2012. Uh, these are all uh, tamalingi trees and invasive trees that all came down, destroyed the uh, water infrastructure, bridges, roads, filled up the harbour with logs, destroyed the main hotel in up here, which has only just opened up last year, and wiped out villages that all have been abandoned now. So it's a massive issue. These are all tamalingi trees. You'd think it was a nice native forest, but it's not. Um, as we know, weak resilience ecosystems becomes more apparent during the following natural disasters, and this has been really obvious in the, in the latest um, post-disaster needs assessments for Samoa and Vanuatu. So what we need to do is we need to uh, step up the fight and get into some of this climate, climate financing money. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I think we've perhaps got time for just one question. Oh. If, um, if anybody has a, a, used more time. A, a question, could they just wait until our volunteers bring the microphone to them? Um, Mike. Thanks. Uh, I noticed that your um, map of participants uh, excluded the Pitcairn Islands. Uh, is that because of the uh, inability of GEF to fund those areas, or is there some other reason for it? Um, Pit, uh, we have uh, 21 Pacific Island countries and territories as members. Pitkin Island is not a member of SPREP, however, the UK is. We also have uh, the UK, France, the USA, Australia and New Zealand are also members. So through the UK, we're just starting to work with Pitkin Island now and I'm particularly got to focus on that at the moment. Um, yes. Great, thank you very much, Dave. Um, so we press on now to another talk from the Pacific, another talk involving birds, and it's going to be Martin Thibault who's going to be talking about invasive birds on New Caledonia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I work for the New Caledonian Institute for Agriculture and uh, as a PhD student, and my project aims at uh, evaluating the risks associated with the red-vented bulbul, which is a, a bird considered as one of the six priority invasive species for the New Caledonian Territory. So my talk today isn't about an eradication program or management strategy. I will present a study I conducted in partnership with the local ornithological society, and that aim at est um, estimated the potential effects of the bulbul on the native bird community. New Caledonia is a tropical archipelago located east to Australia and north to New Zealand. Um, the main city is Noumea, uh, where um, nearly half of the population is concentrated. Uh, it is considered as one of the world biodiversity hotspots thanks to the uh, rich 
plant and uh, faunite host. Uh, for example, more than 3,000 flowering plant species are found, 78% uh, being endemic. And among birds, uh, 114 native breeding bird species are recorded, 51% being endemic. Uh, and the most famous one certainly being the kagu, which is an emblem of uh, New Caledonia. And most of this uh, rich biodiversity is increasingly threatened by habitat fragmentation, uh, mainly mining activities in New Caledonia, um, by climate change and by invasive species. Uh, the species I'm working on is a red vented bulbul, uh, a tropical passerine native to the Indian subcontinent uh, that, is that was traditionally used as a fighting bird in India until a recent ban in January 2006. Um, uh, the bulbul has been transported by Indian workers to Fiji uh, from the early 20th century and then has reached uh, at least 77 highlands, mostly concentrated uh, in the Pacific Ocean, as you can see on this uh, distribution map. Um, there are three main impact categories associated with this species. The first one is the, the damage it caused on uh, plant productions. Uh, the second one uh, is the, its uh, contribution to the dispersal of noxious plant seeds. And the third one is uh, the negative interaction it has on uh, native fauna in, uh, in its iron range. Uh, the first observation of the red vented bubble in New Caledonia was recorded by uh, Jill and contributors uh, who reported an intentional release of cage birds around uh, Noumea uh, just before 1983 following an, an, uh, an illegal importation. And uh, nothing was done at the beginning, so the uh, local population started expanding during two decades. And uh, when we first uh, conducted uh, distribution monitoring in 2008, 25 years after the historical introduction, uh, the range extent was uh, 40 kilometers away from the, the historical introduction point in Numea. And uh, we recently uh, detected a, 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 an acceleration in the dispersal of the, of the bird toward the north of the, of the territory, along, uh, mainly along roads. So in order to explore the, the, the relationship uh, between this uh, new species and the native bird communities, uh, we conducted the point counts uh, along, um, during uh, six years between 2010 and 2015 uh, in 97 sites. And uh, at each site, we uh, count birds uh, in uh, 10, uh, 10 points. Uh, and uh, the monitoring uh, lasts five minutes, during which we counted uh, each bird uh, species present. And then we selected uh, 16 bird species, um, mostly because they were passerine bird species of comparable size and uh, that occur in the same habitat as the red bantle bulbul. -bul. We also uh, considered the coconut lorikeet and the spotted dove that were often seen feeding on the same trees as the, as the red bantle bulbul. -bul. And uh, we <coughs> selected uh, uh, the New Caledonian crow and the New Caledonian Friarbird uh, that uh, reacted very strongly to the diffusal of bubble calls uh, during uh, field uh, experience. And we also considered two highly uh, common invasive uh, species or alien species in, uh, in New Caledonia. So we did our analysis in three steps. The first one uh, aimed at uh, um, describing the, the bubble distribution itself. And uh, we found that uh, the, uh, major, uh, abon the, the main abundance of the red bantle bulbul was significantly um, linked to the, the habitats and to the distance from the original uh, introduction, introduction point. Uh, we found uh, very high densities of bulbul in urban habitats and nearly no, no bulbul at all in, in forest habitats, even on the, the forest patches located uh, around the, 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 the city of Numea, where the, the densities are, are very high. So uh, in the two other steps of our analysis, we, ma we made a focus on urban habitats in order to avoid any uh, spatial uh, autocorrelation. So in our second step, we compared the abundance of uh, the native bird species, depending on whether the bulbul was present or not. 
and found that among the 15 bull species we tested, uh, nine were less abundant, significantly where when the bulbul was present. Those species are uh, lighted in red in this uh, slide. Um, interestingly, all the species that were less abundant with, uh, with the red dental bulbul were native, and we, were, we didn't find uh, that kind of relationships with uh, introduced species. Uh, during the third step, we explored the role of the bulbul abundance on uh, these r negative relationships, and we were able to, to do that with uh, only four species that were sympatric uh, with the red bantle bulbul in more than 40 locations. And uh, for each of these species, we found a negative relationship uh, with the highest abundance of the, of the bulbul. Uh, when we looked at the temporal variations in the abundance of these bird species over the monitoring, all those abundance was, was stable. So, and the, the one of the silver eye was even increasing. And so, and we, um, we considered the, also the, the common MENA as an explanatory variable in all our models with uh, no significant result. So, we try to formulate answers to important questions in terms of management in New Caledonia. Uh, the first one, does the red ventral bulb affect the local abundance of native birds in urban habitats? Uh, we answer yes, at least on nine species, and uh, the abundance of the bulbils uh, seems to matter. And this effect isn't true for all native species. For example, the gray heeled horny litter is often seen in uh, high abundance even in the same trees uh, where the bulbil is present. Is this effect similar to that of the common mina, which was introduced much more earlier than the red vented bulbul, and that is also uh, considered as a highly invasive bird species? And we found uh, we didn't find the same relationship with the, the common mina. And uh, does the red vented bulbul threaten the population uh, of uh, native birds? Uh, the current evidence suggests a displacement rather than local extinction. But further analysis are required, and at the moment, we can't see any regional decline uh, in the abundance of uh, the bird species we studied, even the native ones. Uh, and interestingly, in our models, uh, urbanization per se also impacts negatively on at least two uh, native bird species. So we define hypotheses for future research. Um, we suggest that the, the this negative relationship can be due to uh, competitive foraging behavior. It's uh, uh, documented that the bulbul has a very aggressive behavior. Um, considering the, the fact that we, were, we observed fewer native birds when the bulbul was present, we were, uh, we, we were not able to see any regional decline in the species. We suggest that native birds uh, could shift their distribution from urban centers to rural habitats, and that is also documented in the literature, you are, we are digging it. And uh, finally, is there any threat from the continued expansion of the bulbul on native bird communities? Uh, we will say yes, if the bulbul becomes abundant in, in rural or natural habitats. Thank you for your attention. Great, thanks very much, Martin, for talking to us on Bastille Day. Um, and w w we have time for certainly one or two questions because Martin has kept so well to time. Rob. Uh, thank you, Martin. Could you tell me, um, you haven't really established cause and effect, in my view, um, and the patterns you see with the native birds could just be habitat effects rather than the invasive species effect per se. But presume uh, you, you may have actually um, looked at that and not explained it. Uh, uh, the, the results I'm presenting here are focused on one habitat category. So I've, we may have avoid any, any bias in the, in the different uh, uh, communities in different habitats, I think. Uh, also, all those species where we selected uh, were selected because of several testimonies from local people and from our field studies on, on the, the, the increasing 
uh, the, the decrease are of common birds in, in gardens and in orchards and, and so on. So, yeah. I, I, I can add something. It's that uh, we didn't have uh, so many points to, to do our, our models and because most of the native species I present here were just absent uh, where the people was present. So. Is it still eradicable, do you think, before it moves into the native forest? Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, the, um, as, uh, as it was said just previously, uh, it, it, could be, it could be eradicable, but for now the bilbil is highly restricted to urban areas and shooting birds in urban areas is not amazing. Uh, now, uh, we, we, we discussed uh, two days ago and uh, I quickly estimated that for now we may have around uh, 1,500,000 birds uh, in, uh, in New Caledonia, so it's, uh, it's quite important, uh, uh, effective. Uh, if I will have to, to think about an eradication, I will definitely ask Susana, Susana Saavedra to come and uh, see what the, the situation looks like. Any more questions? No, okay, let's uh, thank Martin again. And we press on to the final talk of this session, which, as Tony mentioned, is not the one in the written programme. It's instead N.T. Keith, who will be talking about fouling problems in the Galapagos. Good morning. Um, so my name is N.T. Keith. I work in the Charles Darwin Foundation as a marine biologist. Um, I'd like to just mention my co-authors, uh, James Carlton from... Williams College and Greg Rees from Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about marine invasive species, which is something that hasn't really been touched in this conference. So just a little bit of a switch around to finish the, the session. Um, so the Galapagos are located a thousand kilometers off the coast of Ecuador in the eastern tropical Pacific. They get um, an influence of several different currents, um, you have the Panama current coming down from Central America, which brings warm water. You've got um, the Humboldt current that comes down from Chile and Peru, bringing cold water. And you've got the Ecuador undercurrent, which uh, brings uh, nutrient uh, cold water up and crashes against the uh, western side of the archipelago. Now, all these currents, the mixture of all these currents, is what makes Galapagos such a Um, corals, you can find fur seal, kelp, penguins. Oh, sorry. Um, is that working? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it makes it a very interesting place. Um, another thing is, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the Galapagos lies in the eastern tropical Pacific. And it's in part of this uh, marine corridor. Um, there's an initiative that um, was started by four countries, which are Ecuador, Colombia, uh, Panama, and Costa Rica. And it's basically all the uh, marine protected areas that lie in this area. Um, the initiative is called CMAR, and I'll be talking about this uh, later on. Um, so the Galapagos receives uh, lots of traffic on a yearly basis, weekly basis. We get um, cargo ships coming to the Galapagos from, from the mainland Ecuador, bringing all the goods in on a weekly or twice a week, um, uh, weekly basis. And we also get um, private boats that come from around the world that come uh, um, either to stop off and buy some book goods or um, to do some tourism. Um, we also get research vessels, we get the, the coast guards, we get navy boats that patrol the, the, the Ecuadorian waters. 
And we also get illegal fishing boats sometimes that come in from Costa Rica or mainland Ecuador. So these, these are the, the boats, the marine traffic that come from outside the marine reserve. And then we've also got some of the local boats, the resident boats, that are the boats that go around islands on a weekly basis with tourism. And we've got the fishing boats that are actually allowed to fish in the Galapagos. And then we've got smaller uh, speed boats that do more of a daily tour uh, kind of tourism. Um, but let's take a step back and look at the actual marine traffic history that the Galapagos has. The Galapagos were, were accidentally discovered in 1535 by Tomás de Berlanga. And since this, um, there's been several boats and marine traffic that have visited the islands. There was pirates at some point, there was whalers, um, the HMS Beagle was there, there's been several scientific expeditions. So there's about 400 years of global uh, marine traffic history. And then in the modern area, um, there's more uh, like in the um, Second World War, uh, the United States had a Navy base in one of the islands. Um, there was also industrial fish fishing for some time. So there's about 500 years where there's been a lot of marine traffic entering the marine reserve. If you look at the research that's been done in the terrestrial side of things, there's been over 1,300 um, introductions of plants and animals. If you look at the marine side of things, there's fewer than 12 species. So how is this possible? All these boats that have been coming in for the past 500 years that brought goats, dogs, cats, rats, etc. How is it that they didn't bring in marine invasive species on their hulls in water ballast or in solid ballast in the, in the old days? So we started thinking about this. Is it actually a fact that there's been fewer marine invasions than terrestrial invasions? Or is the Galapagos marine environment more resistant, even though we know that on islands, invasions are more uh, susceptible? So we started in 2012, we started the Marine Invasive Species Project. And this is a multi-institutional project between the Charles Darwin Foundation, the Galapagos National Park, the Galapagos uh, Biosecurity Agency, the Ecuadorian Navy, and the Oceanographic um, Department of the Ecuadorian Navy. Um, we were working with the University of Dundee and the University of Southampton with um, the funding from Darwin Initiative and Galapagos Conservancy. So at the beginning, we did several uh, monitoring around the different sites in the Galapagos. We did directed searches, basically to lift uh, the, first, um, by, um, the first baseline of what is actually there in the Galapagos. Uh, we identified the marine traffic that was arriving to the Galapagos. We did risk assessments, uh, several outreach uh, programs with the community. And then we started a lot of capacity building with the, our partners in the project. Um, one of the biggest things we started was um, the biosecurity, the inspections that take place. Galapagos is one of the few places in the world that actually get, um, like the boats that arrive in Galapagos actually get inspected, not only on the boat, but actually the hull gets inspected. There's divers that go in the water. I believe the other only two countries that do this is Australia and New Zealand. Um, so what we did um, is we started training the technicians from the biosecurity agency to, um, on how to inspect the hull, what to look for, how to collect the, the samples, and how to work them up in the lab. Through this, we found that we intercepted quite a few um, uh, species. An example there is the Asian green mussel, which is a known invader around the world, and it's caused several problems. We found um, uh, some other mussels and several barnacles um, doing these, this kind of inspection. Um, I just want to mention, if the, if the boat does get inspected and doesn't pass inspection, the Galapagos National Park and Biosecurity ask the boat to leave, clean the hull, and then come back in for reinspection. <clears throat> so doing this, um, we decided that we needed an international workshop and we needed an action plan to prevent the, the, the introduction of marine invasive species. Uh, we did this with the collaboration of Williams College and uh, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And the, the outcome of this uh, first international workshop, not only in the Galapagos, but in the region, was an action plan. And this plan is now being used by uh, the institutions in the Galapagos 
when it comes down to marine invasive species. From this, we decided that um, with all the marine traffic that comes in, we wanted to know what exactly is coming in on the, on the boats. So, so we decided to use a methodology used by the uh, Smithsonian Environmental Agency, um, which is to use settlement plates. Settlement plates are just, if you see there, they're just uh, 10 by 10 PVC plates with a weight on them that you hang off uh, docks and you leave for a certain amount of time and then you collect them and, um, and see what, what's grown on them. So we did this, we did two deployments. We did one in February 2015 and one in January 2016. And we um, created a group of experts, taxonomic experts, mostly from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center um, in order to have uh, the taxonomic expertise to identify all the species. When we put, pulled this, the settlement plates out in <coughs> April 2016, we came across things like this. This is a plate and it's absolutely covered with this uh, Cydian, Cydia siniensis, which is a first record for the Galapagos. Um, it's native in the Indo-Pacific. It got introduced in Panama around the 1970s and it's probably been introduced to the Galapagos um, from Panama. Um, another example is the Bryozoa and the Matthew versitilata, which again is a first record for the Galapagos. Now this doesn't mean that these species were introduced last year. It just means that they've not been um, reported in the past because no one's been looking into these kind of communities. Um, so from the plates that we pulled up, we got uh, approximately 200 uh, species of invertebrates. Um, we've got I, we've identified so far 25 introduced species and 18 cryptogenic species. And then there's a, some that we're still waiting on DNA work. But we've got a mixture of um, species from the Indo-Pacific and the Caribbean mostly. And as you can see, we've got all of the groups. I mean, we've got crustaceans, bryozoans, polychaetes, mollusks, hydroids, ascidians, sponges, everything. So there's a huge um, list of species. Now, as I say, these might not be new introductions, they've just been, uh, they haven't been recorded. Um, these are just some photos of uh, some of the ones that we found on the plates and some that are known to be very invasive in other places um, around the world. Um, so what we're doing now is we're going to continue uh, deploying these settlement plates on other islands in, in the Galapagos and we're also going to um, do it in the mainland where all the cargo ships and other boats leave from to come to the Galapagos. This will give us um, the opportunity to have uh, data from the Galapagos mainland and then uh, through the Smithsonian uh, guys, they will have information from Panama and the States as well. So it's a comparative um, set of data that we'll have. So after all this, after 500 years, then the list of species that was fewer than 12 is now around 63. This list can go up um, as research continues. And then just to finish off, um, one of the things we're, we're wanting to do is, as I mentioned, we're part of um, this group of MPAs in this region. All the work that we've been doing in the Galapagos Islands, we'd like to start replicating in these other islands in order to make this whole area more biosecure and protect the biodiversity of the region. Thank you. Great, thanks, Inti. We've certainly got time for a question or two before heading off to coffee. Um, just yeah, we've, we've done risk assessment on um, all the marine traffic that arrives to the Galapagos, and we've identified that the, the smaller yachts that come from mostly Panama but other places as well are the ones that are the highest risk. Because the cargo boats that arrive from the mainland, the, the port where the boats leave from is actually up a river. So there's a bit of a barrier there with brackish water. So it's mostly the, the small yachts that go around the world that can bring species from not only Panama, but from ports before that as well. Any other questions? Uh, gentleman in pink. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, th this talk, I was specifically talking about the Fallon communities. Part of the project is also, we've got monitoring sites all around the island, and um, looking uh, at, at different types of algae, fish, uh, there's crown of thorns. Um, so we've got um, a watch list of the species that we've identified, where they are, and we have a monitoring program to see if they're spreading or not. And if they spread, um, there's, a, there's a, an action plan with the National Park to deal with them. Could you just wait for the microphone, please? I've got a biosecurity question. You mentioned um, failed ships get sent back offshore to clean their hulls. Um, what's your protocol for that? How far do you send them off, and is that actually realistic for them to clean and come back into the Galapagos? Um, it's um, a protocol done by the Galapagos National Park, and the way it stands right now is the boat is just asked to leave the marine reserve. So that's just the uh, 40 mountain, um, miles around the Galapagos, they, they're just told to leave. It doesn't matter where, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but that's a protocol right now. One, one in the front. We got a similar situation in New Zealand whereby where there have been a study where yachts were coming into New Zealand and when they were checked, they were clean. Most of them were clean when they were asked where they were being cleaned. It was in the Pacific, either Fiji or Tonga. So that puts, you know, the burden is pushing the burden on, exactly. on these countries. So in the case of the Galapagos, is there any way the, uh, the foundation could work with a partner in some country close by where they're setting up a cleaning station? That, that's exactly what we're, we're wanting to do with um, Panama, Colombia, Costa Rica, because that's where most of the boats come from. So that's exactly what we want to do, do it through this initiative, CMAR, which is, um, I, didn't, I might not have mentioned it, it's uh, the, the, the uh, ministries of environment of the four countries that work together. So we can actually go on a government level and maybe actually like get a cleaning station or whatever to expand the, and protect the area. Okay, one last question if anybody's got one. Um, so next to the aisle. Hi, are you doing, or you think you should be doing uh, plankton trawls? Uh, we haven't yet because we don't have the expertise um, at the station right now to go through all the plankton, but um, we are considering it in the near future. Great. Well, thank you very much. And next time,